Hi everyone, let's uh, wait a uh, couple more, a couple of moments to so that others can join. Then we can get started. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome you all to this great event. And uh, we appreciate you for joining us today for this great event. And uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, myself, Kirti. I'm working as an application developer in ThoughtWorks. Uh, so before we start, let me just quickly introduce what Geek Night is. Uh, so Geek Night is an event uh, where uh, geeks comes together uh, to learn, share, and discuss the new technologies. Uh, that is what ThoughtWorks believe, and uh, it is fully organized by ThoughtWorks. Uh, so we, as a ThoughtWorks, always looking forward uh, the new technologies to learn, share, and all. Uh, so that's what we believe in. Uh, so here, that's here we are uh, with our great event. Uh, so before we start, let me quickly go through the agenda today. Uh, we have two interesting sessions. Uh, one is Peers Backend System by Jermia and Siddharth, and followed by another session, uh, which is Observability for Remote Devices by Divya. And uh, before handing over to uh, Jermia and uh, Siddharth, uh, let's talk about the ground rules so that we can make this uh, conversation or this event more effective. Uh, first one is a raise hand. Uh, in case if you have any queries, uh, you need to communicate with our speakers directly. Uh, you Please feel free to raise your hand. There is an option in Zoom. So please make use of it uh, so that we can unmute your, uh, you and uh, will allow you to talk with the speakers. And uh, next one is Q&A session. So if you have any queries or anything uh, needs to raise, uh, please feel free to post it in the Q&A session. Uh, so our speakers will pick it up and uh, will try to answer those questions. And the last one is survey. We uh, value your uh, valuable feedback. Uh, so after this uh, call, I mean, after this webinar, uh, we will be sending a survey to you. So please feel free to post your uh, thoughts uh, and valuable feedback there. So please make use of this uh, raise hand to any session and survey so that we can make this even more communicative. Uh, yeah, so we can go with our first section, which is POS backend system. We have uh, uh, Jermia here, who is working with uh, ThoughtWorks as a full stack developer for the past six years and working in the POS system retail domain for the last three years. And uh, along with uh, Jermia, we have uh, Siddharth, uh, who is working as a tech lead in ThoughtWorks for the last seven years and uh, working in the uh, retail domain uh, for the last two years. Uh, so let's hear from them. They have some stories to talk about the uh, new techno uh, technology which is uh, used in store uh, to set up the store infrastructure. So let's hear from them. Over to you, Jeremy and Siddharth. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Good, Jeremy. You're on mute, Jeremy, if you're talking. Sorry. Uh, sorry, thanks. 
Yeah. Uh, let's start. So uh, we are all aware of course, right? Point of sale. So uh, at least in India, uh, this term was actually introduced by all our supermarket chains, Reliance, uh, Big Basket, and all of them. So uh, with that, we have at least an understanding that uh, we will, we might, our journey to a store might start with a newspaper advertisement, right? So there we will be seeing a lot of offers, uh, or a lot of combo offers and loyalty offers. And uh, with that, we, will, uh, we might be sticking to a particular chain a supermarket chain and we will be visiting them on a frequent basis and we will be going there and we will make sure that whatever products that we purchase are actually um, uh, we are actually getting all the offers possible there and uh, uh, we are making sure that whatever experience we are getting there is worth it instead of just ordering it through uh, online because most of the time when we make an online purchase for some of our household goods we, we will always have uh, a not just for household household good, any item that we purchase, right? We always have a, a feeling that uh, if I go there and physically see the item, I would get a more uh, rather better experience there. And I can be sure that instead of some other person on behalf of me taking an item, I'm the best person who can take it. So even in this era, we can't, uh, we can't, uh, we can't actually, uh, the, the, the importance of stores really, uh, really there. So the digitalization of store and the need of stores to uh, be available itself is there, even if there are e-commerce business and any number of mobile apps are available. So um, in point of sale, uh, one of the one of the main imperative from the business itself has to be that the customer who is coming to the store should come next time as well. So there shouldn't be any hiccups on the on their, um, let it be on the cat, uh, catalogs, uh, how they are actually going to display the items, or even if it is the last place where they actually do the checkout and get the receipt and make the payment and leave the store. So uh, if you take this example, the checkout journey, the final post, right, point of sale, that is the exact place where the customer uh, scans their items uh, and get a bill and they pay for it and they leave with their shopping bag happily in the store and probably they will definitely come back if the experience was good. So that about the posts. Uh, and in posts itself nowadays, uh, in India, uh, we are not familiar with something called self-checkout where the customer itself will be uh, taking the item to the uh, point of sale machine and uh, they will be scanning individual items and finally paying it without having an assistance. So that is uh, something called self-checkout, which is actually uh, pretty much common uh, in the uh, in the uh, in outside India countries, and uh, that is something really growing um, where we don't need actually an assistant because this is a fairly a simple process where uh, anyone can scan a barcode and uh, may get their offers and uh, finally complete their order and leave the store. There are multiple types of posts available. Uh, another example I can think of would be uh, something like a handheld device uh, where some of the store operators would be uh, holding them in the aisles and whenever the customer wants a quick checkout without waiting in the self checkout machines or assisted checkout machines, they can uh, show the item and they will have a handheld device which would be scanning their barcode and uh, quickly finishing their payment through a wallet app or uh, by paying through cash and they will be leaving the store. So these are some of the varieties of post machines that we have come across uh, during our development with uh, our clients. And uh, yes, uh, that about post. Uh, coming to one of the recent, uh, recent uh, movement towards labeling, right? Uh, we, uh, we also heard of this, uh, this term electronic shelf label. So if you are familiar with, if you go and um, go and visit any supermarket, we can see that on top of every item in the shelf, there would be a label which will be saying its current price or its offers and things like that. But one of the main restriction of this particular kind of labeling in those shelves was in case of any changes on the price, right? So prices are something which would uh, keep on changing. Uh, because these retailers will definitely have more offers they can provide and they can provide uh, with uh, because they would be get, they would be getting it a, a for, uh, they will be getting it in a bulk quantity so that they can definitely provide more offers so the prices is something they would keep on changing and offers something they are keep on bringing and uh, uh, by having a label for a large retail shop would be too difficult to maintain 
uh, they they have to actually maintain a lot of a uh, uh, lot of store operators itself for maintaining it so some uh, one of the recent uh, movement towards this is the trend towards this labeling is actually to use an electronic shelf label uh, this electronic shelf label actually uh, would enable it's actually made of initially it was made of uh, normal lcd screens later it actually moved towards uh, more energy efficient uh, e ink display solutions where um, e ink one of the advantage with the e ink solutions was um, once we render anything we don't need any power to retain what it is rendered there so it's only about whenever there is a change we uh, we have to we have to update the display and uh, that display itself will retain that information as long as we uh, there is the next update coming there. Um, so here we can see that for the e display, there are three parts. One would be the display point, display, how we want to display the information in the display. Second would be how we want to update this information. Uh, generally what they would, they would, there are solutions which would be able to manage the e -ink, e -ink displays in the in the store itself by providing a, a floor plan to this pack kind of, kind of uh, uh, solution and uh, generally uh, providing an update it will make sure that the event events are reached to the uh, displays and uh, updated properly and the third part we can think about the in display is actually the uh, application layer where we actually hold the data for it in the day in the way we actually want to uh, which is efficient to manage this data for the in displays Mm, yes, uh, that about the e e electronic shelf label. Um, any queries or questions on uh, MPOS or ESLs? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so coming to our original topic of post backend system, uh, there are various strategies we can or designs we can uh, take towards building a post backend system. Uh, if we consider an e-commerce system, e-commerce is completely on uh, nowadays on cloud. We generally don't keep it on premise because the maintainability part would be tedious there. Uh, so here in the post side also, we can have a cloud a cloud version of uh, backend system for posts at the end because it's all microservices. Uh, but there are certain advantages if we provide an on-premise version of the same post backend systems. Because mostly when we consider uh, retail shops, uh, the internet connectivity could be a, uh, could be a difficult uh, thing if there are a lot of uh, requirement needed to uh, pull data from multiple stores uh, during the check, uh, checkout journey. So um, connectivity is a key point where we have to think of what sort of a design we have to uh, adopt here. One another combination that we can think of is a hybrid model where we will have on-premise as well as a backup towards cloud or, uh, or, or a cloud alone will be also there as and when it is needed. Um, if you see here in the post backend systems, uh, when we adopt a hybrid model like this, I have explained, uh, there are certain other areas we have to think of. Because uh, the moment we think of on-premise, there are n number of other uh, other yeah, other areas of improvement comes in. We have to maintain all the services that we deploy in cloud. Uh, we have to deploy it in an on-prem server. Then we have to maintain them. Like we have to provide a general update to them. Uh, then there would be monitoring of that uh, those uh, those services, uh, how it's performing there, whether there are any issues it's facing. Then. Uh, in order for these services to perform itself, there could be a subset of data that we might have to bring from the master data to the uh, corresponding store there. And in order to uh, in order to bring that data itself, it may not be a one-time task because there could be additional product or prices or even offers would be coming in and it has to be a process, it's ongoing process. So definitely we need to set up a pipeline so that these things can be automated. So anything that we mentioned here, these can't be a one-time task. All of them has to be a automation. Let it be a deployment of any application, uh, bringing data to the store or monitoring the information and probably setting an alarm in case of something goes terribly wrong. Uh, so let's uh, go about data ingestion. So when we think about a store, right? Uh, some of the 
uh, uh, like I can think of three important data which uh, generally needs in any store. One is going to be the product. Second is going to be the discounts which needs to be applied on the product. And third is going to be the price. So prices itself could be of multiple types because uh, maybe customer would be getting a, a valuing a different price, something like a loyalty price. And uh, there could be store specific prices. Then uh, there could be, uh, if there are any employees of the stores are there, uh, they, they would be getting a different price upon uh, right uh, authentication. So uh, these are the three important, um, we can think of domains or uh, data, data, data that we might have to bring to a store. And the pipeline in order to uh, in order to bring this data would be something like uh, uh, that we mostly uh, bring in case of our hybrid model is that there would be some backend systems which would be uh, which would be providing the data uh, data to us probably in a pub sub model or something in an event based model and there could be a combiner uh, which would be uh, combining data like. For example, there could be barcode data, there could be the product general information or its uh, variations of the product, things like that. But when we want to represent this, uh, yeah, go ahead, Sid. Yeah, sorry. Just to add to the problem statement here, what, what we are trying to, what in the, the data part, what we're trying to solve is uh, there could be, let's say, a retail change like, like uh, Big Bazaar. It would have hundreds of stores across the country. Now, uh, the data management, uh, here we are assuming that, let's say we have data hosted inside the store so that it's more resilient and resilient to network disruptions, etc. In that case, we have to ensure that the right data flows to the right stores. Yeah. In that case, uh, there are multiple solutions, right? A simplest solution or the most primitive naive solution could be uh, someone emails data to a store manager inside the store, right? Uh, but we are way past that. We are 2022, so we don't do that anymore. So ideally there would be a centralized single place where all the store data is maintained, where someone would make an update and that data would seamlessly flow to a particular store. Now, another uh, complexity here could be a product might be uh, of different different price in different stores. In uh, in uh, Mumbai's uh, Marine Drive, uh, the same product would be more expensive because people would be, from business perspective, people would be happier happy to pay more right but if you are selling in a in a remote place probably it, it would be priced differently based on logistics and all right so how to ensure all that happens i think uh, that's where this data pipeline comes into play where from a single source of truth we want to reliably uh, sync this data across multiple geographical data centers so you can think of it as a peer to peer network as well uh, no blockchain web3 required here but uh, just as a as a peer to peer network where we want to reliably sync data to these multiple devices i think that's the challenge which uh, jermia wants to highlight here sorry jermia uh, interrupted please go yeah yeah it was nice explaining that uh, problem statement to us i think i missed explaining that problem statement part so yeah compared to an e-commerce also this is one of the biggest challenge stores might be because e-commerce mostly will have a single pricing uh, and it's only about the various offers it might be providing. Whereas a store uh, depends on its geographical location, it would be having different uh, different prices, or uh, or there could be different variations of the product itself. Different it depends on its geographical location. So since we are uh, uh, the problem statement itself is actually to operate on a hybrid model, we are we will be having a cloud data uh, which would be a master data, and from there we are segregating the information. Uh, or we are uh, moving the data to the corresponding stores as and when it is needed or as and when there is an update coming in. Uh, once we have the data there, uh, the customer would be able to efficiently do a checkout with the on-prem uh, on servers with the checkout journey. And after the order creation, uh, the challenge would be to uh, make sure that the data which actually generated from the store actually moves back to the um, original or the, uh, what we say that, uh, the master data. So we, we might assume that the cloud version is the master data 
master database that we may have to hold there, we will have all the information. So in that case also, so whichever stores actually creates an order, it needs to be there in the master data so that later when we have to uh, generate any report or when we have to do any reconciliation of, uh, of the order or when we have to return an order, it would be much easier instead of have instead of pointing at the individual stores to bring the data because uh, we need a centralized information so that uh, it is much easier it is it would be much safer also uh, if something goes to the store also they will always left with one master data for us um, and uh, so, sorry just to add yeah i think i think this is important because um, the lines between e-commerce or let's say uh, a flip card or something and a physical store like a big buzzer or something these lines are blurring right for customer it needs to be seamless i buy something from uh, a big bazaar store uh, and i want to return it if i can help the customer not come come back to the store uh, and treat it as an e-commerce order and just collect it from their house i think it adds to a better experience right similarly let's say I buy something from e-commerce uh, but i can ship only till tomorrow but the same item is available in a big bazaar store like 100 meters from my house I'm using Big Bazaar a lot. Uh, it, nothing, no affiliation. But yeah, uh, basically, like the lines are blurred, and hence it's important that all data, uh, whether it's the master data or order creation or anything, it's it's present somewhere centrally where it can be managed across stores, across stores, across e-commerce, across all uh, avenues possible. I think that's where the the reliability part of it is very very important. Thank you. I can put one more example where I I was really happy to see uh, such kind of re, uh, uh, report, uh, such kind of data moving towards cloud is, uh, cloud is happening. When I was making an order, uh, when I when I had made a purchase in Adidas, one of their retail stores, later when I actually opened my application with and logged in with my mobile number and uh, email ID, I could see all the loyalty point which got added up due to the purchase I had made in the physical store. And with that, when I made a second purchase using the application, I was able to avail all the points I got from my first order. So these kind of uh, flexibility of uh, flexibility to towards uh, user, right? So with this, actually, we are making an ecosystem where the user is actually sticking towards one uh, one particular uh, business. So uh, after seeing such sort of a thing, I was like a bit hesitant to uh, because I have that much of a, a loyalty point available in this particular seller. Now, if I go for another seller, I have to actually make another payment and uh, probably I may or may not get an offer there. So better I stick with this seller. These kind of things would be really helpful for the business in uh, in order to grow in their aspect as well. Um, the second part of this thing that we can see is since uh, we are talking about a hybrid model, there could be always uh, challenges that in order to um, reliably sync the order data back to the uh, cloud, right? There would be a number of issues uh, there, uh, because this may not be happening on a synchronous way. So order would be completed, but a customer left the store also. But at that point of time, there could be chance that the uh, internet connectivity, connectivity wasn't available. So something like of a, a job we, a batch uh, batch processing system we can set up, which would be keep on checking uh, the on-prem service database to see whether the information has been synced to the cloud data or not. If not, it can always make sure that this information has been synced. So uh, these are some of the uh, things that we have made sure in order for uh, this data to be synchron uh, synchronized in a level fashion. Yeah, coming to the next part where, uh, where one of the major challenge or one of the biggest challenge where we had to face was when we had uh, to deploy all the microservices which needs the backend systems to perform needs to be deployed in the store servers as well. Because on cloud, as we are very much familiar with the pipelines in probably in a GitLab environment or something, uh, we will be setting up the pipeline. We will create a tag and we will we can easily set up the uh, deployment. When but now when it is coming to on-prem servers, we have n number of on-prem servers depends on the number of stores we have. And assume that if we have five to six microservices which needs to be deployed in all of the stores, then that's going to be a tedious task. There definitely it's a point of improvement or point of play. Uh, that's a point of place where we have to bring some automation. Otherwise, it's going to be truly difficult to uh, 
retain such architecture so um one of the uh, one of the solution that we brought here or one of the solution that we currently have is um we will have a docker registry where we will have all the images available and published and uh, we have certain services which would be pulling or uh, which would be operating on a push based or pull based uh, approach and bringing those images to the on prem servers uh, kubernetes clusters and uh, it would run efficiently there and as and when there are updates we have uh, we can have uis and app uh, special uh, specific services which could bring these kind of images back to the servers and keep them updated there um so do you want anything to add here on the deployment yeah. side so i think i think again uh, the same challenge as we talked about this earlier right the, the challenge here is that the places where we want to deploy are geographically distributed uh, in cloud or in when we are uh, developing a website it's centralized it's very much in our control it's in the same network uh, and cloud net cloud providers give very good inter intra vpc connectivity and all that so it's very very it it becomes very easy but when we talk about such distributed a true distributed system right geographically distributed these challenges amplify and that's where uh, these the deployments also become very challenging like if we trigger deployments uh, they cannot be synchronous they have to be event based everything in such distributed system has to be event based as much as possible for most reliability here we have mentioned kubernetes docker etc which is just one form of packaging right it can be anything it can be a, a a simple jar file that has to be downloaded but since docker everyone uses docker now uh, we we went with that example and again kubernetes is involved uh, but but the challenges again amplify and uh, the how how do we reliably ensure that a service is deployed it's healthy it's up and running with the right replications in place etc i think i think those those are the challenges that needs to be solved and many a times uh, we can use some, some uh, of the shelf tools right uh, there are companies who have created of the shelf tools for for such things i think shopify has a point of sale system there are some other uh, companies who have who created uh, that uh, jenny we are going to talk about that in upcoming slides right or is this a good time to mention that uh, yeah uh, i think uh, for the deployment part we can talk about that here itself sir perfect perfect yeah uh, but what when we have worked with our uh, clients what you have seen is that when we buy a saas tool for very very critical and core things they work out very well in the beginning uh, but i think they have less flexibility in terms of customizations let's say we want additional security uh, on top of that we want uh, private networking across across this you, you must have heard of private networks like tail scale etc right which which basically uh, which are not easily integrable in in a custom of the shelf tools uh, similarly if you take the entire software for your checkout journey it works very well in the beginning out of the box but in our experience with what we, we have worked with our clients we have seen that the core tools are very very limited in the basic functionality uh, similarly in case of deployments if you take if, if you bring some if you buy something uh, and, and and not build it the amount of customization is very very less so all these things have to be taken into uh, consideration uh, retries failures disaster recovery etc across the board and in deployment it becomes even more challenging because let's say you are deploying something and there is a customer transaction going on how do you you can't deploy at that time right i mean uh, back end you can still deploy because kubernetes has the rolling update strategies right but what about the front end if you are deploying the front end it might relaunch in between so there are uh, strategies uh, which we had to adopt which we had to create and think because of the unique problem statements uh, in terms of deployment over to you jenmia uh, i'll i'll monitor for some questions if i have Yes. Uh, are there any questions, or uh, the, you are checking the chats, right? Okay. Uh, so one of the uh, one of the other challenge we might always have to solve in uh, whether it be the e-commerce side or let it be the let it be the store infra side is the observability part. uh so here all the microservices we have would be generating a uh, lot of logs or it can generate lot of time based uh, matrices on 
on how often a certain number of transactions are happening or things like that, which are actually business key points where they can use it later in some other uh, particular report. So uh, some of the important tools that we can make, uh, make use of here is the Prometheus and Grafana side. So Prometheus will be creating the data, uh, data and Grafana will be making sure that the visualization uh, of the right visualization for the data is available there. And uh, yeah, uh, Sid, you want to add about it? Sure, yeah. I, I think Divya in the next uh, session is going to cover specific observability strategies for remote devices. Um, but if you look at the entire point of sale or self-checkout or other types of uh, store in-store systems, these are classic distributed system challenges, right? These are classic edge devices, which are truly distributed and uh, with amplified challenges as compared to cloud. Uh, observability also becomes uh, e even more challenging than a centralized solution. For example, let's say we have 100 stores. From observability, what we want is a single place where someone can check the health of all the systems in inside the stores. Uh, similarly, they can they can get some proactive alerts. Uh, for example, let's say a store server goes down. In that case, someone has to be notified. Uh, it's very important who, because uh, we have trialed with generic channels or generic emails sent to groups, they don't work, right? So uh, tools like Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, et cetera. Uh, Thanos is a tool which is built on top of Pr Prometheus for, uh, for uh, longevity of the metrics because Prometheus out of the box is, doesn't scale very well uh, uh, for a lot of metrics being stored. But, but yeah, there are tools available. The idea here is uh, what metrics to capture because there are standard metrics like whether a service is up or down. Uh, then there could be customized metrics like an event which happens. For example, customer is trying to make a payment, but it fails. Uh, it fails once, it fails twice. At what time do we raise an alert and to whom? Which, what are the right channels, right? So all those things become very, very important. And because these are distributed across the stores, there has to be an aggregation to a central location. We, we cannot ask people to log into each store and check uh, individual uh, metrics, right? Because these metrics have to be aggregated and compiled into a some sort of, uh, uh, we have heard about 4K metrics, right? So that aggregation should give the health of overall stores, uh, all the hundreds of stores that someone have. And different levels of uh, people in an organization. For example, if I am a tech lead on a project, I might be interested in some specific metrics. If I am a CTO, I don't want to know whether my store in Mumbai in this area is doing well or not. I want a much higher level view of uh, the, the, the stability of the stores. If I come to know that, okay, one store went down for one hour, a tech lead would freak out, but a CTO probably will say, okay. But if it happens across 10 stores, it's a different thing. So, so the target audience, uh, the aggregation of these metrics, how to do. Uh, similarly, log aggregation, because logs are developers' best friend, right? And if there is an issue, we don't want to SSH into a store and uh, check the logs. It's also security risk. So what kind of tools we use? For example, uh, Fluent is one such tool which aggregates these logs across various stores and agent runs on each of the on-prem things and it aggregates into centralized location. A Splunk, uh, Datadog is a new and upcoming uh, startup which shows promise in terms of aggregating all these things across distributed systems. So all these tools uh, help a lot. Uh, Divya, in the do attend next uh, session by, by Divya. She covers all these things into a lot more more uh, details. Any any questions uh, so far, folks? No, Siddharth, we are good. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jeremy, what do you? Sure. Thanks. One of the other key area where I have seen the observability is uh, in terms of uh, optimizing our uh, infra as well. So uh, sometimes we would be overestimating how much of a resource we might need to run some sort of some services. And later we might get to know that, okay, compared to an e-commerce experience, a store may not need a lot of uh, resources in order for successful day running it running it. So having the right observability metrics will definitely give us the chance to understand on what uh, on what duration to what duration we need uh, or arrive at the right numbers in order for our uh, in order for our architecture to perform at its best. Yeah. Uh, 
So that was also one of the key area where I uh, where, uh, where we have seen that the usage of this was helping us. Um, yeah, uh, with that, uh, we are coming to the last session of our generic session. Any questions so far? Yes, I think I think we covered a lot of breadth in the interest of time here, 45 minute talk. Uh, but you'd be very happy in delving into the details of these, right? Because again, as I said, these are distributed systems and uh, things like the cap theorem, things like uh, disaster recovery or even peer to peer, all these things, how, how they can be leveraged in these scenarios. I think each of these are themselves an hour long talks. Uh, we'd be happy to cover those in detail in, in upcoming sessions of Geek Night, uh, depending on, on the interest, of course. Uh, so one of the other thing that we have observed with our client is compared to an e-commerce, if something goes really ro uh, wrong, right, there is only logs or alert which would be saying something is going wrong. Whereas if it is a, a point of say, if it is a store, something is going wrong, there could be definitely a store operator or uh, there is a customer who is standing in, inside the store, which is facing this issue. So if it is an app, the customer can come back later at their um, at their uh, sweet time and uh, reopen it and see. But here it's a store. If something goes to really wrong, and if we can't uh, do a DR at the disaster recovery at immediately, we might even lose a customer uh, immediately. Uh, like uh, if this happened often in a store. So that is some of the other challenges we have to make sure that the experience as always on par with the uh, e-commerce or the other experience that we can provide there. Yeah, uh, with that, uh, thank you everyone for attending the session and please be here for uh, Divya's session. She will be giving you the depth of the observability part. Yeah, thanks to Mia, thanks to that uh, for that session. It was very informative. Uh, so if you have any doubts, uh, please feel free to post in the Q&A session so that they can uh, answer it later also. So yeah, let's go to next session, uh, which is about the observability mechanism for the uh, remote devices. Uh, we have Divya here. Uh, talking about Divya, she is working in ThoughtWorks as a full stack developer for the last eight years and working in retail EOA system for the last three years. Uh, so as we know, we know the importance of observability mechanism in our projects, right? So uh, here she is with the uh, mechanism for the remote devices. Uh, yeah, over to you, Divya. Thank you, Kirti. And thanks, Sid, for rooting for my session. You have laid a nice foundation for me. Cool. Uh, so I'd like to keep this a little bit of an interactive session. And if you people are comfortable with chat, you can type all the answers. I'm asking for questions in the chat itself. So I'll manage to look at the chat and answer stuff. So a quick look at the agenda. Today, I'm going to talk about, I wanted to talk about what POS machines are, but given um, Jeremy and Siddharth did such a good job of explaining what POS machines are, I'm not going to go deep into that. Um, the only thing I want to talk about is POS machines are also referred to as stills in a few areas in common English language. So that's the vocabulary I want you to uh, take a look at or me using POS or TILS as equivalent. Okay. So my session is about observability, but you wouldn't see the word in the agenda. We'll get to why in the consequence slides. And a lot of things which uh, Sid spoke about is availability and why is it important in POS machines and stuff like that, right? So Towards the end of the session, I'll talk about what we have done to implement observability in the current project I'm working with for POST machines and then the tools we used in our uh, code bases. So let's start, right? So this is where I start with the first question. So if you want to uh, answer this, you can pop out in the chat. So what is basically monitoring? Sorry. Okay, nobody is answering, so I'll go ahead and answer. Um, basically, monitoring is something which will tell you what is broken and why is it broken, right? Um, so, 
Um, now, and this can be done only with a bunch of data. Now, we are collecting a bunch of things as a part of monitoring, which is basically in terms of logs, uh, metrics or whatever that is. And how do we use this data, right? The data you use for collecting or doing monitoring, right? So again, monitoring data is used for monitoring. And a couple of other things is basically, this is very business specific stuff, right? Reporting, visualization, and dashboards. So basically you want to have like a business report of how many transactions are going on in my POS machine globally, or at a store level, or for a device type and stuff like that, right? So these are the kind of information you look for. And the third thing is you want to alert when something is going off. So that's what the monitoring data is used for, right? Now, what is alert? If someone is sending something in the chat, not able to see. Yeah, Divya, there is an issue with the chat. It's uh, disabled. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we are working on it. Okay, cool. Then I'll continue, right? So, yeah, yeah, sure. thing is nothing but a notification that tells you that something has gone wrong in the system. Now, a notification can be anything here, right? It could be an email in your inbox. It could be a pager if you're talking about a medical system when something is of most, most important, right? It could even be a ticket in your queue if you have a queuing mechanism for answering incidents and stuff like that. So alerting is basically nothing but a notification which is telling you something has gone wrong. Now, think about a person who has newly joined your team and then they got an alert. This is a typical scenario we would see with uh, a grad or a new person in the team that, you know, I have an alert. Now I'm going to a panic mode and I don't know how to fix it, right? So what can we do about this, right? An alert, which can tell you that something is actually going wrong. And can it also tell you whether, what are the steps to follow to fix this alerts, right? Most of the times you are doing an automated alert when you know what caused the alert. And you have seen this alert for a lot of time and then you know how to fix those alerts, right? So if an alert is descriptive enough to give out a steps of how to fix it, then it's more informative and more practical than, you know, just alerting that something is off. So that's one way of doing alerting. Now, let's look at when do you start alerting, right? Now, for example, your system needs 20% of the disk space free to be able to function properly. Now, when do you start alerting? What percentage of this space full would you start alerting for? I see a lot of chat here. One second, I'm trying to see chat. Okay, there is stuff in the Q&A session. Notify, okay. Hey, hi, sorry, Divya. Uh, the chat is disabled. There is some glitch going on. So uh, please feel free to, uh, folks, please feel free to use the Q&A session or raise hand uh, to express your thoughts. Yeah. So for example, if I start alerting at 80% disk space full, that means I have no window to act on my alert rate. But think about when you start alerting at, say, 65% disk space full, right? That means there's 15% more disk space for your system to function normally. And then that gives the developer or the person who is actually going and fixing the alert uh, enough time to respond so that there is zero downtime to your system. So it's also important how do you alert, what you put in your alert, and when are you actually alerting, right? So these are the two things. Next, we've been speaking about something has going wrong, 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 right? But what could that wrong thing mean? An exception occurred, which is typically what happens on a runtime. You couldn't do much about it because it's already happened. The only thing we can do is next time we can make sure that the exception cannot occur. An error happened. Probably this is a known error which has happened um, saying that, you know, there's a 404 on a server and something. You can't do much around those things, right? So the third thing is basically business failures. We'll dig more into that. And now, Let's think about the scenario where a deployment to a machine actually took eight hours. We started measuring the deployment time and it took eight hours. What do you alert on the scenario? Hmm. 
Okay, no answer so far. Jiva has raised her hand. Let me hello to talk. Yes, go ahead. Uh, can you come up with the question again? We I missed that question part. I'm oh, sorry. I'm doing. Huh. So a deployment to a machine took eight hours. Would you start? When would you like? Would you think this is a bad scenario to allow down or good scenario to allow down? So, so you're saying that eight hours time is expected, right? Deployment or take. I'm not saying it's expected. It took eight hours. That's the data point you have, right? Who do you alert on this? One thing you can say, once the deployment is done, we can notify that, okay, deployment is done. That we alert. Okay. So somebody says, probably due to high deployment time, we can alert. Okay. Um, let's look at another scenario and we'll get back to this question. Okay. So the second thing is, uh, there is an ecosystem. Let's think of it as a cluster of servers where 20% of your servers are always offline. Um, would you alert on this? Okay, there's one answer going by what was said previously, it might not be an alert. Okay, that's a guess. Um, let's go back to this thing, right? A deployment of a machine took eight hours, but um, then I'm talking about a scenario where this is a very highly available system and the code was downloaded and then the deployment started to wait for the system to be available for a downtime, right? There's a tiny window of downtime only you can take. Think of it as a 24 bar seven store where the customers are walking in and out of the store like 24 hours a day. And when do you actually bring the system down to apply your updates? So the system waited for seven hours, 55 minutes to update. And then it took five minutes to just update, right? In that case, it's not an alert. It only took five minutes to update. And it's just expected that it's waiting that seven hours, 55 minutes to be able to patch this over before it, right? Now, in our next scenario, again, in a store probably, you are actually keeping 20% of your machines as buffer machines when there is high traffic. When I say high traffic, um, is the supermarket busy around the clock? No, right. Around a lunch hour or when people are getting back from office, there is high traffic, right? So if you think about those scenarios, on those times only, you want to keep all your machines open and running. Otherwise, you want to shut few of your machines for cost consumption, electricity bills, whatever reasons, right? So it's normal in that system that 25% of the machines are offline. In these cases, you might not want to alert. So what are we getting at with these two questions, right? It is important to define what is normal for your system. A normal for one system is not a normal for another system. So let's take one more example. Um, here, I'm just making a statement that anything which is okay by the business and the platform is normal. Um, business could be people who care about sales, other things, and platform could be something which is technical folks or a tech lead or a developer who is there on this uh, system working, right? So you have to come up with a set of norms saying, if 25% of my service are down, it is okay, but not 50% because I cannot trade with 50% of the servers round the clock, right? That's the kind of business rule you have to establish for every system. Now, extending that, if we are talking about accuracy versus speed, it's just a common example, right? If a e-commerce search, I'm just taking an Amazon here, right? You got, you went into amazon.com and started searching for something. Now, would you care about accurate results or would you care about the responsiveness of the search? Responsiveness, obviously, right? But if you went into your banking account, would you care about the time it took to print your statement versus there are wrong numbers in the statement? It says that you have only two rupees left in your account versus you're supposed to have one lakh rupees left. You care about accuracy there, right? So the normal is different for different systems. 
so before we get into what is healthy, I'm going to stop here for question and answers. I don't see any open questions. If anybody has questions, you can pop up now. Yeah, Divya, there is no question and uh, the chats are enabled now. So uh, now it will be active. Yeah. Thank you. So we can now answer my questions, right? Let's go ahead. Is it enough if a system is healthy, right? Let's look at a scenario again. For example, the health probe of a system has actually returned a 200 status, right? Everything is green. Now, when I try to do a transaction or try to do an operation with that system, it threw a 503 error. Would you still call the system healthy? No. Okay. No. Oh, uh, okay. That's pretty obvious. So let's move to our next thing, right? Extending that, an e-commerce platform. I'm taking Amazon here just because it's known for everybody. I'm not saying Amazon is bad. Okay. So you're trying to place an order. The order got created, and the payment has failed. Would you say the system is completely available here? Might be, depends, right? Yeah. So I would call this a partially available system, right? So what's common in both these questions? We are not just talking about boundaries of the systems, right? We are not saying the system is healthy, not healthy in a binary level. We even care about whether the action the system is supposed to do, which is the internal state of the system is healthy or not as well, right? Now that's what brings us to availability, uh, observability, sorry. Observability is basically depending on internal state of the system, you should be able to derive some external outputs and say that my system is healthy, available or not. So that's what observability. So that's the definition, but let's dig into a little more things, right? Um, so far I said that observability is not mentioned in the agenda, but why observability can exist on its own or why not observability cannot exist on its own. So, so far we spoke about monitoring, alerting, availability, right? Without monitoring data, I cannot say my system is observable, right? Without logs, metrics, I cannot say anything because there is no data collected for observability. So observability is, is like a wrap up. So your basic building blocks for this, think of a Lego, right? I only have tiny blocks. Then I'm making a big picture. The basic building blocks of observability, logs, metrics, on top of it, you have observability. With the observed data, you're calculating the availability of the system. And once you have some derivations on top of it, that's where you're actually creating alerts on top of that system. So monitoring, Alerting, observability, availability, everything are close friends. So they are all siblings of the same family. Now, again, another statement, a system can be called more available when I know it's more observable, right? If you go back to the same example of Amazon, if I know that my payment service is working, a probe to the payment service is actually 200, then, I'm 95% sure that given other glitches that my order is gonna get placed, right? Now, without that information, I cannot say with 100% confidence that just looking at the health checks, a system is available or not. So that's why we say a system is more available when we can observe that system. Now, a little bit on the monitoring data, right? We've been speaking about this, logs and metrics. Logs are self-explanatory. But metrics are a new concept to the industry. Now well, let's talk about what are metrics, right? So metrics are basically numeric formats of data, uh, which are very tiny, tiny, and 
as we all know, the business loves numbers, right? Now, can metrics be enough to, you know, measure, monitor, alert, anything? No, right? Say, I have a temperature of 104 degrees, and this is just a metric. So temperature number 104. But why my temperature number is 104? That cannot be done by a metric. That cannot be explained by a metric. Your temperature is 104 degrees because you have a fever. So you should have some backing data to be able to explain why that number is there. So that's why logs and metrics are both important for an observable system. So metrics generally tell you why, whether something is good or bad, but why cannot be told by metrics. And a good system which is observable is capable of telling you why something is bad and what caused it, right? Cool. Uh, a bit of theory here, bear with me. So what kind of general metrics are, uh, are you looking for in a system, right? So this is coming from the Google SRE book, okay? What they say is, there are four golden signals you should go about measuring in your system always. All these four things are there. So latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. Latency is basically, um, take an example of a web server, which has a HTTP endpoint, right? You hit your HTTP endpoint, and on a 200 or a success scenario, it's coming back in 10 milliseconds. But on an error rate, or if 500 or 503 happened, it's actually taking 10 seconds to come back. What's causing that 10 second latency? There is something which is lying there, right? For example, in a failure scenario, it's trying to connect to a database and it's going into a retry loop and coming back later. So you should be able to understand based on that number, why something is taking a lot of time. So that's latency. Second thing is traffic. Say I have a HTTP endpoint again, right? How many requests go through my endpoint every day? Thousand per second, two thousand per second. But in the non-peak hours, there are only 20 requests per second. But when an error scenario happens, there is a spike of 10,000 requests per second. So it's it should be telling you that there is a normal threshold, but there is a spike in the threshold when something has gone wrong. So you should measure traffic always, right? The third thing is error rate. Now, we all know errors happen all the time, but how many requests are erroring out? If one request in 1,000 requests is erroring out, it's 0.001% error rate. But 500 requests of 1,000 requests are erroring out, and they are coming back, retrying to the system again and again causing more error rate, more load. So you should be tracking how many requests or how many errors per second or request are happening. So that's the error rate. Now, the last thing is saturation. First three are very self-explanatory, but saturation is a bit tricky to measure based on the system you have. Saturation is basically telling you what is the load your system can bear. You can relate to it as a load test. Say, for example, you have a performance environment. You're going on hitting your um, endpoint like 10,000 times in a concurrent manner, and it has failed at 20,000 requests per second, right? But at that 20 point, uh, 20,000 requests per second, there is some spike which will be happening in your system. A load on the CPU or RAM is choking or network IO is high. There's some symptom which causes, right? So that symptom should be actually put as a bare minimum or a benchmark and then measure your system to say, at this point, I break down. So beyond this, I cannot take any requests. So that's one of the signals you have to measure. Any questions on this? Cool. Now, we spoke about a lot of logs, metrics and everything, right? All of this has to be aggregated data, right? I cannot actually hit my cloud server with a metric every 0.1 seconds or one second, two seconds. What is the cadence you care about for your metrics? In a system which is not so available system, it's okay if you put your metrics at 10%, 10 minutes interval. But in a most highly available system, which is supposed to perform 
more transactions or banking system for that matter, the server should be highly available. You cannot lose 10 minutes of data at a time, right? So you should be defining how often do you compute your metrics given all the system time as well. So, so far we spoke about general observability concepts. Now, where does this tie to POS machines, right? So that's where my project learning is coming to picture. I worked with a UK retailer for around three years, which is actually trying to do a POS modernization where they are taking all their legacy systems down and then they wanted to build their custom POS, including the operating system, along with the software which runs on top of those machines. Now, a bit of what's in wise, we have about 40,000 machines across the UK, which we are supposed to deploy to. And these machines are not in a cloud. And nowhere in the in-cloud premises also. They are all in remote locations across 2,000 stores across UK. So these are all remote machines we are talking about. Now, can I deploy to these machines once in a year and say that no more updates, the customer is happy, they are able to check out? No. We have a weekly cadence of rollouts, which we wanted to do on top of these machines. Now, it could be a simple software update, or it could be a complete wipe off of the disk and then reinstall the OS completely, right? So there's a pretty complicated stuff we are talking about there. And how do we make sure that the deployment is complete, the tills are healthy, are they able to do transactions or not? That's how uh, we built an observability system, which is slightly custom of our own. Another thing, which might be a trivial problem, but a big problem in a few enterprises is shared ownership. So the operating system, along with software I spoke about, the software is composed of 30 different Docker containers and developed by 30 different application teams. Now, when a production incident happens, you always go into this game of finger point at each other, saying that it's your issue you figure out, it's your issue you figure out, right? How do you draw boundaries between, this is this application team's issue and this is this application team's issue. There are also logs, log aggregations. How do you define your transaction flow? All these things actually make a lot of sense, right? So that's the shared ownership problem we, uh, we land. Um, a bit on schema, right? I'm directly jumping into schema here, but basically what we tried doing is, instead of a simple health check probe we spoke about in the Amazon example, we started defining our health is a business health check. It just doesn't say my system is healthy, but it also tells me whether my system has all these capabilities up and running or not. For example, the machine here is a POS machine or a TIL, right? The resources here are CPU, RAM, the common resources all these containers share. The services are the bunch of Docker containers I'm talking about. And the other things are basically the TIL should be connected to a network to be able to talk to other systems and stuff like that. Now the services offer a bunch of features, but a feature is dependent on multiple components. When I say multiple components, I'm talking about a microservices architecture here, where when a customer is actually trying to add an item to a cart and then pay, there are three to four services which are involved here, right? One is the user interface, obviously. Then there is a customer order service which holds the basket. And then there is a payment service which is actually responsible for payments, right? Simple stuff. Let's go to this. So. Here, the UI component is dependent on two different things. One is the ability to create an order. Second is the ability to create a payment. But without these two things, the user cannot check out an item and get out of the store, right? But the ability to create an order here is completely dependent on customer order service. Say for any matter, the service is done. Can UI say I'm healthy? No, right? So for UI to be healthy, then customer order and payment service, both of them should be healthy and the connections to those things should be healthy. Now, if for example, UI has a capability of switching between pages from order creation page to payments page, there is some error which is happening in between. Now, in that case, UI's capability of doing some functionality of its own is compromised. So that is a complete failure of health checks. Um, the second thing is, if customer order service is down, then 
UI can still do its job, but customer order is down. They're not down because of some functionality they own. So we called it as degraded or partially available services, right? The third thing is customer order service, payment service, UI, all three of them are healthy. The happy case scenario, right? The health checks are green. So we divided the health checks in a way where it's a big JSON, which says I have feature one, feature two, feature three, which is dependent on component one, two, three. And the JSON actually is very self-explanatory on whether my service is up and healthy or not. So that's how we went ahead and implemented the observability health checks for the tells for this client, right? Now, a little bit on tooling, what are the tools which each and every other container has done? So we have about 30, 40 containers and each and every container did logs, did metrics, and then did their own health checks. The health check is the scheme I was talking about. And logs are basically all your business logs along with error, info, warning logs, whatever you wanna put in your service. And metrics are again, common metrics which are talking about business metrics as well as technical metrics here. Business metrics are something like, I've created 10 orders today. That's a business metric, right? But my HTTP endpoint was hit 10,000 times per second. That's a technical metric a developer cares about. So all these metrics are used, are implemented using open tracing and open telemetry. And we had Prometheus container, which is running as a client on each and every one of these machines. And that is reporting to a central Prometheus server with Grafana as our reporting tool. So that's how we have done this. And that ends me to my presentation. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Is that crystal clear or? Okay, somebody raised a hand. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I missed the part of deploying these things, right? You mentioned it's these are all the remote machines. So how mm -hmm. have you managed to deploy to all the machines? Okay, that's another talk of its own. <laughs> if I'm getting another slot at Geek Data, I'll tell you. But I'll uh, give an overview of how we have done it, right? It's a big architecture. Basically, what we did is um, we have three modes of deployments today. One is bare metals when you have like a pretty new till. And second thing is reinstalling a particular till. And third thing is just patching it in, right? Patching it in can be anything. It could be just bringing down one version of an application and bringing up a new version of an application. That's one way. The second way is something on the operating system has changed in RPM package or something. So that's another type of patch which we have, right? So all these changes are actually bundled together and we call all the changes together as one change ID. So anything which changed uh, calls us something changed in your system and go ahead and do a deployment. So we have a bunch of cloud components which have the layout of, you know, one store has 10 different lanes and 10 different lanes are of type SSE, COASC and blah, blah. Uh, SSE, COASC are basically self-service tills or card only tills and stuff like that, okay? Now, when we say uh, a deployment user can go ahead and schedule a rollout. And the rollout contains two parts for us. One is a download of the software. Second is application of the software. Download can happen in the non-trading uh, in the trading hours, but rollout of the software only happens during the non-trading hours today. When rollout happens, we have one tiny component which is running on each and every till, which keeps track of what is the desired version I'm supposed to have and what is the actual version I have. And it's a diff deployment basically we do. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So on last question, how, how long mm -hmm. it will take to do a deployment for all the machines? Uh, we have about 16,000 machines. If we are just talking about application or patching on the operating system, we finish that about in three to four hours. Uh, but if it is a reinstallation of the OS, it, it takes about a week or two because we schedule to a set of stores uh, on a weekly cadence, like Monday, the stores have to go, Tuesday, the stores have to go. And based on that, it happens. And we also have something 
like a fail safe mechanism. If you have a batch of 1000 machines which you want to deploy today, and the first set of 25% machines has failed, and there is a failure rate we have set, then we abort the rollout and figure out what has gone wrong, go back, fix it, and then roll forward. So it depends on how many errors happen in the given rollout, because most of the times the errors are because of the issues like network is not good in a store and stuff like that. So we have a state machine which tells us at what stage they failed and stuff. So that's also an observable system which we have. Yeah, sorry for another question. So is that deployment automated or someone is doing? Uh, the trigger to the deployment is manual. Think about uh, it as some team which is sitting in India who is triggering the deployment, but the machine speaking up the deployment, everything is automated. The only scheduling part is manual. So, because I choose what list of stores have to go in which deployment. Okay. Cool. Thank you. No issues. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Divya. Uh, it was very informative and uh, it was you started with the very basics and uh, went in very detail and it was very helpful. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the session and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, for this event and we will be sending an email uh, survey form with you after this webinar. Uh, so share your feedback as, uh, with our speakers, organizers and uh, yeah, that's about it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.